Dr. Marshall Lemoyne with PhysioU, and welcome to the Teaching Table. So if we think about the cervical spine, which is the one that has the most red flags and caution behind it, right? Um, so you want to know about your, your Ds and your Ns, right? So think about your um, five Ds, three Ns, so nystagmus, all that stuff, uh, diplopia, double vision, drop attacks. Ask about that with patients. Um, we think about some of the common ones that might make somebody unstable. So do they have any ligament instability? Do they have any fractures? Are they a possibility of ligament instability, meaning they have things where they've taken a lot of steroids, so asthma, chronic asthma. Uh, they're someone who might have a risk for a fracture, so osteoporosis. So those are people that are also contraindications um, that I would want to worry about. Um, people with nerve root pathology, right? So they have radiating arm pain, leg pain. Um, they have any type of neurological reflex. We're probably going to do any high velocity thrusts to that spine because we want to make sure we're we want to just play it safe, right? Now, if someone just has some numbness and tingling in their leg, right, but their reflexes are normal, myotomes normal, I have no problem performing a thrust on that patient, knowing I've checked for safety of that patient. There's a systematic review, I pulled up a more current one, that looked at adverse, aspect, adverse effects of cervical manipulations, since those have the biggest uh, risk factor with, you think about the vertebral artery and stuff, and they said that there is no risk of these. There's a very, very low risk of these if you ask the appropriate questions, there was no trauma. They didn't have any dizziness or nystagmus. All, if, if all those things have been cleared out, right, then there's no ad adverse effects. The people that had the adverse effects when they narrowed down were the people that had, um, they had some type of trauma to their neck or they had other symptoms that could have been cleared out with better questioning. So, so they're safe if we're using them appropriately. Okay. So, so with that being said, why don't we go over some of the common clinical prediction rules for each one and we'll demonstrate some of these spinal manips. So for the, the clinical prediction rule for a cervical high velocity low thrust amputation is symptoms less than 38 days. So again, acute 10 degrees difference in rotation. So if we look at right rotation versus left rotation, either passively or him actively doing it, there's a 10 degree difference, meaning there's probably some type of mobility issue. When we did PAs, we were able to identify some type of pain and stiffness at a level. And then we asked him, hey, have you ever had your neck cavitated before? right, where someone's done a quick stretch and maybe there's a pop, or that, mm -hmm. you know? Are you worried about having that done at all? No. Okay, perfect, so a positive experience, a potential positive experience. If he says, oh man, I'm super worried, that made the outcomes less. So those would be our things. So as we go through it, we already know the level based on doing an assessment of which one was the stiffest. So if we're gonna wind it up, right, we wanna wind up with a side bend, go ahead and relax, a side bend, side glide. We don't wanna wind up with rotation first, right, because that's where you can stress the vertebral artery. So it's a side bend, side glide. So relax, I got you. Side bend, side glide. My body turns with them to get in position, right? Here we then want to do some rotation to find our end feel, right? So that would be our wind up, right? Side bend, side glide, rotation, a relative slight PA, and then the manip is a rotational up glide. That's our neutral gap. The hold I have here is called a cradle versus you can do the same thing with a chin hold, where it's side bend, side glide, rotate, and then your manip is that way. So it's the same manip whether you want to do a chin hold or a cradle hold. All right? So a loosey goosey. So side bend, side glide, rotate, and that would be it. Three, two, one, okay. go. For CTJ, cervical thoracic junction, high velocity thrust, the clinical prediction rule is less than 90 days right? They're not having to take medication for their pain, meaning it's not severe pain, right? It's, they have a negative nears, meaning it's not necessarily a shoulder pathology. Um, they have good shoulder range of motion. So greater than 127 is the number, but just think they have good range in the shoulder, negative impingement test. They have good internal rotation of their shoulder. So uh, 53 degrees in the glenohumeral joint. So we think about, hey, you know what? This person that has this kind of shoulder upper thoracic pain, it's not coming from the shoulder. We did these shoulders look negative. So then let's treat the thoracic junction. Right, so here, you're kind of holding their, your, their forehead under your hand. Use your thumb to wind up and block the lateral aspect of the spinous process. So here I'm on T1, side bend towards that, and then rotate away. As I rotate away, I want to make sure I pin them with my thumb 
and my thumb so that he stays locked up. From here, I transfer my hand to then block on a zygomatic area to help stabilize his head. Here my hand swings over to the other side to get a nice tissue lock, and then you're thrusting through this angle towards the scapula. All right, let's do it again. So I'd say the biggest thing is this wind up when they're here to here. How do, I don't want to necessarily take my hands off to change because then we lose it. So it's kind of learning to spin on your thumbs, all right? So chin down, good. So loosey-goosey, I gotcha. So block lateral aspect, side bend, rotate, spin, take a deep breath in, breathe out, spin. Good, and then help him out of it. Another option for CTJ manip would be having the patient place the direction they're gonna look to, place that hand up, turn your head to that side. Good, so that kind of winds up the cervical spine. Again, your hand is on the same location on their cheek to kind of create a little bit of stabilization. The other hand's on the lateral aspect of the spinous process. Kind of grab some of the upper trap to help you to be able to push. If I'm just pushing like this, that's a small surface on a bone that can be painful. So I'm kind of grabbing this whole area to thrust that way. This kind of creates a block. So I'm not really pushing too hard. The push is here, right? Just kind of find the rhythm and thrust. If we recap, thrusts are safe if we ask the appropriate questions and do the appropriate screening, right? They're effective, right? All the, all the prediction rules and the guidelines give them an A rating, right? So they're safe, um, they're effective. And then the benefit to them, right? There's lots of benefits, not only just this mobility deficit problem, but there's a lot of research that talks about just pain gating and neuro, neurological changes um, in terms of breakthrough of pain, improved range of motion, um, ability to activate muscles better. So we should use them in our practice. And the only way we're gonna use them is if we become more comfortable and practice them. So practice on each other if it's safe. Um, the out, the out, the long-term goal should not always be to get a cavitation, right? It's nice when we do, you kind of feel rewarded for it. But studies show that even without a cavitation, just the thrusting itself, that quick stretch, um, patients get benefits from it. So I uh, hope you guys enjoyed and you learned something. Uh, take a look at all of our social media accounts um, and drop us a line, give us a like, as well as go to physiou.com and take a look at our mentoring minutes and teaching tables. Hope all is well guys and we'll talk to you later. Take care.